Mbabo, you know, member of parliament in Bakasi East constituency. So in the morning when I wake up, uh, the first thing I do is to pray because uh, in my religion, the Bible says that you seek ye first and unto the kingdom of God and every other thing shall be added unto you. So the first thing that I do is to put God first. Because when you go, when you kneel before God, you can stand before any man. That's what I do first. Then the second thing that I do <laughs> is morning glory. <laughs> After morning glory, yes. Dikishaomba, then morning glory. After morning glory, then I grab a book, I read a book. Yes. Uh, currently, I'm reading uh, different books. Number one, there's a social contract. Social contract talks about man in its state of nature. Man in the state of nature. The book written by Jean Rosso. Another book that I'm currently, currently reading is a book called Dictator's Handbook by Alastair Smith mm -hmm. and also written by two people, Alastair Smith and uh, Bruce Bieno de Mesquito. It talks about why bad behavior is good politics. Okay? <laughs> yeah, and then uh, lastly I'm reading Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. And he says that it is not by the benevolence of the chef nor the butcher that we get to have our dinner, but by their interest attached to it. So currently I'm doing three books at least to, to add some knowledge in, <laughs> into my mind, yes. Monday is just like any other day. Weekday is like any other day. Um, I wake up, I go to the office. Uh, uh, at times I go to my constituency, depending on uh, how the activities are. I also go for my businesses, I do my own things. I meet friends, I meet constituents. It's an easy day for me. Tuesday is a parliamentary day for me. Wednesday parliamentary day for me. Thursday parliamentary day for me. Friday I also meet my constituents. Uh, Saturday and Sunday I purely keep it uh, uh, for family. Saturday for family. On Friday evenings, nowadays I don't take alcohol so I, 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 I don't visit uh, clubs so much. I can only go to a club when I want to play pool table. I love pool table. And uh, I take my wife for a movie on a Friday evening. Then Saturday, spend time with family. Also meeting constituents. Sunday is my day for church. Every Sunday I go to church. After that, I take my kids to play. Then after that, I can play with my wife. Why did you quit alcohol? I decided to quit uh, alcohol because uh, enough was enough for me. It was time for me to quit alcohol. The Bible says that if your eye makes you sin, you remove that eye. If your hand makes you sin, you remove that hand. So when I was taking alcohol, I enjoyed it so much. I don't judge anybody who takes alcohol, but it was enough for me. So I decided, I made a decision on, uh, in January 2020. Up to date, I've never tested alcohol. So it was just a personal decision because I believe that once you don't uh, engage in alcohol or any drug, then your mind functions very well. By the time somebody who drank the previous uh, night wakes up the following day, probably from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m., already, personally, I'd already woken up by 5 a.m. So I function better and I'm more productive when I'm sober. Yes. How oh, excellent. I've stayed with my wife for 12 years. And one thing I can say and thank God about is the gift of uh, my wife. I got a very good woman. I was a very lucky man. A woman who's so loving, beautiful at heart, also beautiful physically, uh, very religious, a saved woman. When I, whenever I used to drink long ago, she used to pray for me. So, mimi ni kwa baye ananiombea. 
But God answered our prayers and I stopped alcohol. But the secret to a happy marriage is very simple. Number one, you must be compatible. You must communicate. In a relationship, you must communicate. Then rise above petty issues. Very important, put God first. I pray with my wife daily in the morning and in the evening before we sleep, we kneel down, we pray. Because we, we make God be the leader of that family, be the leader of that house. And date. Like the first day you met your boyfriend or your girlfriend. Date that person. Treat that person the same way. You don't need to go to expensive hotels. You can go anywhere in any kibanda. You can travel anywhere. Discuss issues affecting your lives. Discuss short-term goals in your family. Middle-term goals, medium-term goals, and then long-term goals in that family. Be guided by goals and vision in a family and love in that family. So you date. Take your spouse, your girlfriend, your boyfriend for a movie. Travel. Go do breakfast somewhere, lunch somewhere, dinner somewhere. It doesn't need to be expensive. But that element of time is very, very important. Then rise above uh, petty issues. Whenever you see yourself uh, having, uh, having uh, you want to exchange, just avoid it. Be the bigger person. One partner must be the bigger person to rise above it. And then very important also, you must really make love as frequent as possible so that you avoid temptations outside there for both the partners. So, so marriage is very easy. People always say, you know, they're in hell when they are married. But the first day they were meeting, they were so much in love. Then you wonder why these people changed along the way. Number one, if you want to change your husband, change yourself as a wife. If you want to change your wife, change yourself as the husband. Okay? The moment, for example, you drink as a man, you come home late. If you started by coming home at 5 a.m. and then you come back and your wife welcomes you, gives you food. Meanwhile, you have to take into account that you are inconveniencing her because she should be sleeping. Or if she's woken up, she should be preparing children to go to school. But by the time she welcomes you softly, smoothly, in a loving way, then believe you me, this man will start coming back at 3 a.m. From 3 to 2. From 2 to eventually 11. From 11, atanza kuingia kama kuku. At 6 p.m. You appreciate your wife. Appreciate your wife. Appreciate how beautiful she is. How she is dressed. It is very, very important. So that ata mtu wakimpata huku inja, kimwambia you are beautiful. Already these are things that anasikia kwaku. You see? Kama unapata kitu pia, because men are meant to work. Ukipata kitu, weka kitu something for your wife for every month. At least, ataenda salon, kama kuna gari ataweka fuel, kama kuna friends ata entertain those friends of hers. At least she has something, and as a nunua airtime, because a man is supposed to provide. So as a man, at least every month, wekea bibi yako kitu. Tunailewana hapo vizuri? But you see, it's not a must, only if you have. Yeah. But it is very important. Such things, akuna mtu mwenye naeza shutua bibi yako na mambo ya pesa, mambo ya mapenzi, mambo ya kumdate, mambo ya kumake love na ye. Because anazi experience all those things. So I think when, uh, when, when you do that, then you will have the best marriage ever. But the most important thing, if you want to change the other person, change yourself. Change yourself. For a man, appreciate your wife. Akipika, appreciate. Eat that food. Akitoka kwa nyumba, appreciate. Appreciate her beauty, her dress code, how she is. But again, you must correct each other in marriage, but not embarrassing each other. Whenever something is wrong, sit down, discuss it. Talk about it. Communicate. Very important. In a day, let no day pass without asking how your wife is, how your husband is. Because they spend most of the time 
with other people. For example, myself, Nikiwa Parliament, the whole day I spend with other people. Narudi at home in the evening. So I'll, uh, uh, in the course of the day, you need to be communicating. Ask your spouse how your day is moving on. Those are small things that are very important in marriage. So I think for marriage, there is no miracle. You just have to play by the rules. And the rules are just very simple. Yes. Where do you get these answers you respond to people online? Uh, personally, I'm a social person. And uh, I don't look at a person that you are in a lower level or medium level or higher level. Because those are just status. But you need to treat human being as human being. You need to be very respectful because you don't know where this person will be tomorrow. And above all, when you are a leader, a leader must be a servant. The Bible says that for you to lead, you must agree to serve. It's in Matthew. So whoever wants to be the greatest among you must first be the servant, must be your servant. So as a leader, you need to interact with people because people go through different things. People go through family issues, financial issues, political issues, marriage issues. So if you can provide a solution because a problem shared is up, solved. It's very, very good at least to socialize, at least to communicate with people because you don't look at your status because you are a member of parliament. Now you, you want to put a, a yourself in a certain status. That is bullshit. You don't need to do that because what about tomorrow? What if you are not in that status? You will, you'll, always, you'll, you'll also expect people to respect you and address you. So me, having grown from the slums, and it taught me a lot of things, basically I respect people. The person I don't respect is the person who wants to crisscross my path. Yes, but generally, I don't lose the sight of a gazelle for a dashing squirrel. Okay. Yes. Uh, apparently, at some point in life, you will feel like, you know, it's too much. Why me? Why is this happening? I grew up in the slums for 25 years. That time, uh, I knew that this is the last, this, what I'm going through, I don't need any other person to go through it again. Because when you're selling changa in the slums, and policemen are coming to arrest your mom, coming to whip people in the house, beat people literally, in the house and you see these children learn by what they see, not what they hear. So it sticks in the mind. So it really affected me, it affects your growth even up to now. There are certain statements you can always want to, you make a statement people are wondering, is this a member of parliament? It is growth. How you are brought up is very important. That's why I can also advise parents, spend time with your children. It's not just the material things you are giving to your child, it's not the car that you are buying. It's not even the school that you're taking your child. You, may, you might be taking your child to the best school, working hard to take your child to the best school, but what the child will learn in the school, apart from books, are totally different. The child turns out to be totally a different person. At least in a day, spend 10 minutes with your child. Ask the child how school was. Help your child in homework. Talk to your child like a grown-up. See what to know, fix a vision in your child's mind. So coming back to your question, at some point in life, you feel like, hey, it's too much. But you see, during our time, we were left to grow. Because our parents were choosing between looking for money for your food, for rent, and for school fees, and also babysitting you, or rather training you in life. So we were left to grow. Even in Ikifika, mom would ask, uh, but nani akawapi? But the old day, akuuliza. Because you can't blame her, because she was looking for daily bread for you. But having learned that, you find that in the slums you could easily say that, okay, this life is too much, me, I want to give up. But I want to tell you that whatever you are learning now, whatever challenge you are going through now, is a solution in future. If I didn't go grow up in the slums, I would have not known how to handle people as a member of parliament. So it has taught me such that if Amina, you tell me that you are hungry, I know what it means to go without food. If I see a child sent away from school, I know what it means to lack school fee. If you tell me that you're in prison or you've been arrested, I know what it, what it means to be arrested. 
because I went through that life. It prepared me psychologically. This is the time I'm realizing that, I, that really God did well for me to start from the slums. So for those who want to give up, whatever you're going through now is going to be a solution in many years to come. Plus, God knew you before you were born in Jeremiah. In the Bible, God, the Bible says that I knew you and I knew you when you were in your mother's womb. And I have plans for you, plans to make you prosper and not to destroy you. So whatever you're going through, so long as you're not dead, which means that it is meant to be part of your life, to strengthen you, to wisen you, to make you grow. And one day you will benefit. So anybody who's thinking of giving up, do not give up. Do not give up. Fight on, soldier on. If you're disappointed, pray about it there will be a solution about it. What is the biggest lesson you've learned as a member of parliament? Uh, my life is full of lessons. I've learned so many lessons ever since I was born. May I will just say that I'm, uh, I'm, 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 I'm really loved by God. And God has a purpose for me. Because what I've gone through, even as a member of parliament, even in my first term, having three criminal cases uh, when we were then fighting with the former head of state. Um, and then after that, my election petition from high court to Supreme Court, how people were treating me then, calling me former member of parliament because my election was nullified. So generally, I've learned so many lessons from the time I was born to now, for being in the slums for 25 years, going through the life in the slums, your mom being arrested when, you are selling ch when she's selling changa. You, personally, I slept in the cell from the time I was in primary school. So there are so many lessons. My life is just full of lessons. But I love them because what can't kill you can only make you stronger. But with these lessons that I learn, it helps me know that people experience challenges, different challenges. So that when you come to me with a challenge, I'll respect you, I'll treat you respectfully and I'll help you look for a solution. I will not judge you because I don't have the yardstick to judge. The Bible says no man is righteous before God and judgment is just left to the Almighty God because every man has a weakness. Every man has done one or two things which are bad, which are not righteous, which is not in the spirit of their religion. But all in all, we leave it to God. Yes. I do respond to my DMs, but not all. Because like in Facebook, uh, as we speak, uh, the messages that I have there is around uh, 18 million messages on Facebook. In Instagram, I have 6.8 million messages. In my, in my email account, I have around 12 million. So it's not practically possible to respond to all this but randomly I do respond randomly without choosing on who to respond to so just randomly I say okay let me just respond to the following but I'm um, telling Kenyans not to get tired probably I'll respond to yours maybe you are almost giving up because I have many messages and you have a challenge but that's the time that probably I would have chosen to respond to yours yeah <laughs> uh, I've received, or rather I receive almost on a daily basis, so many weird things. Nude photos from very beautiful ladies. But I'm like, okay, there's a reason why they're also doing this. Probably Maisha Pia Ningumu, Nailewa. Because if it takes a lady to take a nude photo or a, or a video of herself naked, Probably there's something lacking that she's looking for. And uh, I consider it as just as a challenge. I don't judge them. I treat it as a challenge because I know that probably there's something this person wants. Either they want love or they want financial assistance or they want guidance. But all in all, I'm just like, okay, as a leader, this is what you go through. So a leader, lazima uwe kama kikapu ya mwenda wazimu kikapu ya mwenda wazimu inabeba chakula inabeba pesa inabeba chupi inabeba all kinds of trash 
So personally, I don't judge anybody, but DMs on a daily basis, napata DMs kali sana. Temptations, zile serious. What do you fear in life most? Um, I fear nothing in life. Because the way I live my life, I just turned 35 years. I'm going to live up to around, let's say mortality rate right now is around 60, 70 years. But if you live well, let's say 95 years. So at 95 years, I've lived for 35 years, I have 60 more years. 60 years left. Can you multiply 60 years by 365 days so that we know how many days I have on earth? 60 years times 365, because a year has got 365 days. 21,900. So I only have 21,900 days left on earth. Either way, I will have to die. They say memento mori, that either way, you will die. Memento mori, either way, you will die. So 21,900 days. The, in those days, I don't have any extra second for fear to invade any of those days. In those days, I have to leave a legacy. A legacy that I must leave as a leader. Before I became a leader, then success was about Babu Owino. What I have, what I've made, what I will get. After I became a leader, success is about others. Leadership is about others. So for me, success is to see that child in Embakasi East constituency or any other part of this country go to school. It's not sent away from because uh, of school fee. Success to me is to ensure that roads are constructed in Embakasi's constituency, that my people get water. Success to me is to ensure that schools are constructed. Success to me is to ensure that we help each other. Now, if I'm working within that limit, the lower limit being 35 years and the upper limit being 95 years, and the days remaining are only 21,900 days, then what do I have to fear? After all, I'm the son of the Most High, the King, the Almighty God. So should I fear a fellow human being? I will never, and I can never. But I can respect a fellow human being. But I fear nothing as Babu Owen, nothing completely. I don't even fear myself. So the reason why I started my online classes is simple. Babu Oweno is a product of education. Were it not for education, I would have not left Nyalenda slums to the University of Nairobi. Were it not for education, I would have not been a student leader. Were it not for education, being at the University of Nairobi, I would have not contested in Embakasi's constituency. So were it not for education, I would not be, I would have not been a member of parliament. Therefore, education gave me an opportunity to be somebody in life and somebody who is willing and ready to hold another person's hand. So I said that if it is only education that made me live Nyalenda slums, education can make a child in Garissa come to parliament, be a CEO. Education can make a child in central region be a manager somewhere, be an actuary or a lawyer. Education can make a child from Trukana, coast, region, western region, Nyanza region, be somebody in life. You necessarily need not to practice that because what I studied, I don't practice it. But education gave me an opportunity to be a member of parliament. So education can give you an opportunity to be anybody in life. And education is an equalizer. It's only through education that will put you at the same level with the who is who in this nation. So I'm, I'm a respecter of education. And that's why I said the little opportunity that I have, I will ensure that I transfer or dispense knowledge carelessly to other students to other learners, so that they, we create that opportunity. We might not impact all, but that person who was almost giving up because of school, we say, if Babu did it because of education, I can do it. So the main intention is to give you the morale that if Babu came from the slums because of education, you can leave the slums, you can leave your villages because of education. And from next year, I'll go across the nation in various counties, various constituencies, I'll be teaching and motivating our children from grade four to form four in various levels. So that at least whenever, whatever I didn't enjoy 
in my youth, they can enjoy it. Whatever motiv motivation I didn't get, I bring them to them. I bring it to them so that it makes it easier for them to at least fight and make it in life. You know, I mean, uh, life, life is funny. And uh, to joke about it, they say life is a sandwich of shit. The more you eat it, the more you shit it. When I was in the slums, in primary school, when I was selling Changa in primary school, policemen didn't care. They used to arrest us, they take you with your mom, they put you in the cell. Either remove money or you stay in the cell. I grew up as a person who was like, okay, is this what life can give us? You and your mom being arrested. My dad died when I was in class three. So I was with my mom throughout with two of my siblings. I used to sell Changa for me to raise fees. Mom used to be very sickly. But they still arrest that sickling person. They come in the house, they whip people. You see your mom literally running away. I'm like, okay. So I used to be arrested a lot in primary school. In high school, the day I was going to do biology practicals, I was arrested on the night to biology practicals. And I thank one OCS called OCS Wanyama. He was in Central Police Station in Kisumu. In the morning at 8 a.m., I started screaming in the cell because I couldn't afford 500 shillings. You know, a tot of Changa, that tot of tequila glass, that small one is 10 shillings for Changa, 10 shillings. So you can imagine if you sell that 500 ml, it's 300 Kenya shillings. But you, 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 five, you 300 ml, si melewesha watu sana, jamani. So which means in a day you would even sell only 50 shillings. So I couldn't get that 500 shillings. But that policeman having heard me screaming and knocking at the door, he came and asked me, what is it? I told him, I have exams, I've been arrested. I was arrested yesterday night, I've spent here, I have exams. He released the Land Cruiser, dropped me to Kisumu Boys, Central uh, Police Station and Kisumu Boys around a uh, five minutes drive. I was dropped there, I went and did uh, exams in home clothes. But I just thank God, you know. But uh, that I spent in the cells. When I was a student leader at the University of Nairobi, I spent quite a number of uh, <laughs> times in the cells. You remember when we were comrades. So from there, when we were fighting, when I joined parliament, I was in the cells. So I've seen the highest part of life and the lowest part of life. That leaves me with no option but to respect a fellow human being. The day I alighted at Ambassador, when I came to Nairobi, my first time to step in Nairobi ever was in 2007. So the day I arrived in Nairobi at Ambassador, the first question I asked uh, the person that I saw next, that where is State House? Then he pointed this direction. Then I said, that's where I belong. But people do say that do not talk about your plans. And I can tell you that the Bible says that what a mouth confesses shall come to happen. Talk about your plans. You give them positive energy. And I can say that that's where I belong. And I can tell you for sure that people say they advise you don't talk about your plans, you'll be fought. Anybody who wants to fight me, let them come now. I'm ready for them. I want to face them head on. I want to fight them. And mostly, as I told you, that I'll never lose the sight of a gazelle for a dashing squirrel. But anybody on my path, be prepared. Because if you want to fight me, also know that I will also fight you. But the main intention of what I'm saying is that I want a bigger platform, a larger platform, to change the lives of Kenyans. In this earth, on this earth, we were born with nothing and we will live with nothing. The only legacy we live on this earth is to change lives for the better. And that's what I want to live. So moving forward, that is my vision. And my vision, I have a vision to transform lives. In 2027, I can be a governor. I can be a governor in Nairobi so easily, effortlessly, because I know who I am. I can be a governor in Kisumu so easily, so effortlessly. I can be a deputy president in 2027 so easily because of the belief that people have in me and my popularity. And in 2027, I can still also go back to Mbakasi's constituency to serve 
my residents and my constituents. So in 2027, I have four options, but there's still time. It is tomorrow's problem, it is not today's problem. So that decision will be made as of tomorrow. But the ultimate goal is where I pointed at. That's where we are coming to, yes. Nothing much, just to thank Kenyans, not to give up. I know life is not easy, life is very difficult, but don't give up. Just fight on, soldier on, put God first in everything that you do. And I know your ways will be opened up. When one door closes, don't be worried, another one shall be opened. But keep knocking, knock, knock, and keep knocking, and the door shall be opened. Ask, ask, and keep asking, and you shall be given. Seek, seek, and keep seeking, and you shall find. Thank you, God bless you all, and I love you all.